Karen Armstrong is among the most original, impactful, and inclusive religious historians. And her best-selling books have deeply influenced the global conversation on the role of religion in both the ancient and the modern worlds. Here is my conversation with Karen filmed at the New York Historical Society exploring humankind's evolving relationship with the earth, life, and the cosmos. It really is great to see a, a live audience, something I haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> and Karen, it's a, it's a great honor for me to spend some time speaking with you tonight as someone who has read so many of your books and you've really had a profound influence on my own thinking about so many things. And one way of framing the conversation tonight is in terms of something that you've written quite eloquently on, that there are different ways of knowing about the world. There's different kinds of knowledge. I come at it from physics. Yes. You know, I try to understand things like that, you know, but I, I full well understand that the knowledge that we've gleaned over the course of scientific history is not going to exhaust everything that we can know about the world. So you described in terms of mythos and logos. Can you give us a sense of that? Well, logos is reason, and that's, that's where, you, where you're good at. And, uh, but mythos is also important too, but it's something that's got rather displaced in, in the modern world. A myth has been uh, I, uh, described as something that in some sense happened once, but which also happens all the time. It's talking about timeless truths. Very often today, uh, we've become so rational in the way we talk that, what, that a myth means something that's not true. Uh, that it's something, you know, oh, well, it's a myth, it didn't happen. But that was not the way that was seen in the a in ancient world. Everyone knew that we had to have logos, uh, that's your science, that's your reason, uh, but we also needed myth that helped us to understand why things happen um, and the, the more the emotional and, uh, uh, and difficult aspects of our life that don't, uh, that, 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 that don't can't be controlled by reason. We all have uh, moments of uh, awe and wonder, fear and terror that reason can't touch, science can't touch it. And, in the, and we, we, we want meaning in our lives. Uh, it, we're meaning-seeking creatures. And unless we have some kind of sense that our lives have some meaning and value or significance, we fall very easily into despair. And so myth helps us to counteract that despair. But would you say that there is, or, or perhaps not, a, a fruitful notion of, of truth when it comes to myth, or is that sort of a category error, like my asking whether the table is happy or the number five is married? Questions that just don't mean anything. Does the question of truth when it comes to myth, does it mean anything? Yes, it does, because there are different kinds of truths. Uh, sci you have your scientific kind of truth, which is vital for all of us, and that's where logos comes in. But there are also truths about human behavior, death that we all have to face, and we, we, tr we don't know how to deal with it. Uh, we, we are beings that fall very easily into despair if we don't find some kind of meaning. And, uh, and sorrow and, and why? Why are we here? What are we supposed to be doing here? And that's where myth and religion uh, comes in, and literature too, which, which also helps to helps us to get, grapple with the feeling that uh, our lives often seem so pointless uh, and, we can, and, and insignificant. What are we here for? What are we doing? How can we, when we finally die, say, say that we've had, uh, done, done anything good for the world? Or uh, how do we deal with the pain that we see in the world? Uh, the suffering? Uh, how do we deal with death? How do we deal with inequality? Uh, injustice, um, and uh, so all of these things that are not easy, easily answered. Yeah, but can I ask you a question of context in there? Because when I think about this 
categorization of logos and, and mythos, there are two distinct ways that it plays out inside my head. One is, I think about science mm -hmm. as something which in principle is giving us universal truths that are relevant like way out there in the, in the cosmos, whereas mythos is deeply tied to the human condition. And when I think about Earth as a little tiny pale blue dot floating in the mm -hmm. vast expanse of space, it's like logos covers all of it, yes. and mythos is very tied to the human side. But at the same time, I'm also willing to say that our science yes. is just the human attempt to understand the world, so maybe yes. they're just on equal footing from that more limited perspective. And there may be people out there, who knows, looking at us with great pity um, <laughs> that neither of us are hitting the mark and, and have yeah. nothing to do with, with other kinds of reality that are beyond our ken. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that, that, but nevertheless, we're stuck with this, uh, aren't we, with this perception of being here and now in this, this troubled planet. Unlike other animals, uh, we know that we're going to die. Um, and that, has, uh, has, ha that overshadows our lives. Uh, and, and what happens to us when we die? How do we face the fact of our own mortality? Does the fact that we're just going to die and disappear in the world mean that our lives have no significance? Because we do like meaning. And uh, I don't think science can give us that kind of meaning, do you? I mean... Well, it's an interesting, yeah. interesting question because the fact that we know that we're going to die is something which, in terms of its relevance to the way we live our lives, something that I first really encountered in a book called The Denial of Death mm -hmm. by Ernest Becker. Mm -hmm. And when I read that book back, you know, in the early 20s, it had a profound effect on me. But surprisingly, when I spoke to other people about it, many would say, I know I'm going to die. I, I, I don't really think about it. It doesn't bother me. But in the end, that, I think, is really just the power of culture, the power of religion, the power of other mm -hmm. things that allow us to hide behind this gloss of not caring when I agree with you that, that we deeply do. Yes. And, and this is, is vital. In fact, you know, Stephen Jay Gould said that all religions begin with death. Is, is that your yes, take I, on I it? Think that's re I think that's true. Uh, because uh, the fact that we are going to die means we've got to try and make some kind of point, see some kind of point. Um, and that we, we have, and it, it, it overshadows our lives when we see people dying. Um, and and is, is, there, is there any, most of the uh, world religions begin with uh, why, why death? The Buddhism, for example, sickness, old age, and death are what he saw in life, the mm. Buddha. How do, how do we cope with this? Uh, and, uh, and of course, sickness in the pre-modern world would have been far more uh, extreme than it is today. I mean, most children w would not live to, to grow up. Um, and uh, s uh, illnesses could just wipe, pe wipe people right. out. So sickness, old age, and death, said the Buddha. We've got to find some other kind of way of dealing yes. with, the, with these realities that enable us to use the lives that we have, that the time that we have, productively, uh, instead of just sitting in terror, or else having, when you come to die, having led a pointless life. And I think, at their best, the religions, uh, the religions try to help us with that. They sometimes fail. I mean, I remember as a, as a schoolgirl, as, as a Catholic school, and we used to have retreats every year, and um, the, the, the Jesuits would come, and they, they all, Jesuits always begin with death. And so it was, the first day was very gloomy. I mean, uh, <laughs> there we were, sort of. And they tell us terrible things, you know, about a young boy who was sitting, you know, th thinking he was absolutely fine and why should he worry. And somebody uh, w decided to pin a little uh, picture over his, uh, over his bed 
Well, unfortunately, that hit a gas uh, pipe, and the child died, uh, died that day. Well, the, we told these stories, and uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, and usually we went to bed in, in, in fear and gloom and terror. Wow. Uh, but yes, it was, it was wrong, and I don't think it really helped us very much. Um, so, so would you say that that myth, which then develops presumably into the world's religions, is it something that comes from us, from this unique self-aware consciousness? Yes. I think or is it, is it, it, does it, maybe it doesn't matter, is it out there? Are we touching something out there or is it purely something that's within us? I think it has to be something that, that is within us um, because really we know nothing about what's out there. Um, and the Beth myths don't give us a lot of dogmatic truths about, say, realities called God, for example. Uh, they help us to deal with the, with, with the problems of life, but in a, myth, in, in a, in a story that somehow makes sense. Um, and th oh, to live in a way that does somehow provide uh, a sense of meaning. I mean, in science, do you find that science helps you to live a better life? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question. And, and for me, the answer is yes. Yes. And, and let me just spend 10 seconds saying why. So I find that when I understand the laws of quantum mechanics that mm. govern how molecules come together to yield structures in the world, I find that when I understand the laws of general relativity, that allow the universe to expand and mm. stars to coalesce out of particles and galaxies to coalesce out of stars, it gives me a sense of connection right. to the universe. And it also gives me a deep sense of gratitude for the mere fact that a collection of particles happened to coalesce into a being that momentarily gave me a sense of self-awareness and consciousness yes. that allows me to appreciate the wonders of reality. Mm. And it is the scientific insight that to me lays bare all the processes that allowed that to happen and that enriches my sense of who I am and my connection to the wider world. I, I wouldn't say that it answers all questions though. No. I don't think that we, we get answers to these questions. Um, the, the religions try or some of the religions try to tell you that there is a, an answer to this, that there that when you die, for example, you will go to heaven, for example, or um, other religions, uh, uh, such as Buddhism, are a little more uh, hesitant about this. There are, uh, there's a sense of reincarnation, that you'll, you'll come back, perhaps. And uh, it, the Jains, for example, say that if you live a, a, good, a good life, you'll go up on, on the scale. And human beings, they say, are at the top of the scale. But they also say, which, and this is important, that uh, the tiniest thing has some kind of existence that we know nothing of, that each thing has its own form of existence. So a flower or a stone, uh, these, if they behave, become really good stones and flowers, um, they will go up the scale, and gradually they too will uh, arrive at humanity. But huma human beings can push themselves right down by behaving in, without compassion and uh, mercy. The idea is to somehow transcend the self, that selfishness uh, that uh, puts me first all the time, uh, that doesn't consider others, which means getting rid of the ego. Uh, which we, 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 we all cling to our sense of self. There seems to be a lot of talk these days about getting rid of the ego. You know, you hear it in mindfulness training, in meditation, in psychedelics, mm -hmm. that it's a way of ego dissolution. Do you think that if religion is in some sense a pathway toward that, I always find it curious to then juxtapose that with your comment before about a potential afterlife, mm. which seems like we're striving to preserve the ego for all of eternity yes. and pretty nice living conditions yes. as well, that's right? that's it, yes. 
uh, I, uh, that, that is what sort of t turned me off a lot of, of religion, in fact, that you're just looking for a, a, a sort of comfortable role in, in the hereafter. Uh, but that's at their best, and I, I, we must sort of press that. Uh, the religions are telling us that you, th the best way of uh, somehow achieving uh, in life is to get beyond the self, get beyond the ego. Um, and that one does that in, not necessarily in, in, not in yoga, which not everybody can do. It's a very skillful, th not that you know that sometimes by what, how people do yoga today. Um, very often, yoga is seen as, you know, sort of, you come out and you're, you're all toned up and, uh, you know, you, 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 you look into yourself and you feel great. The point about yoga, as the Buddha was to do it, is to get rid of the ego by reaching out to others. The Buddha achieved enlightenment by, not by sort of going deeply into himself and perfecting that self, but by sending out his compassion to every corner of the world and not omitting a single creature, flower, or human being, however ghastly they might be, from his area of mm. concern. And uh, that, I think, is, is what uh, we, we need today. So much of our spirituality seems to be de de with me, 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 and uh, so, sort of for my peace of mind and my highly tuned body uh, as a result of all this yoga. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's embedding you in the ego that you're trying to transcend. And I think what the religions at their best are trying to do is to help you do that. Yeah. But too often, they're made a sort of ego trip um, whereby you... you, 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 you polish your own uh, self and your own soul and you're looking for a nice comfortable role in heaven or uh, but no it's it, that the, the thing is and I think we need this more in our culture is to put the ego the selfishness to one side uh, day by day hour by hour and then you start to expand uh, and uh, I think so a lot of the the myths at their best are telling us how to do that. So when you think about those myths or even the stories in sacred mm -hmm. texts, there certainly are a substantial fraction of people in the world who would consider themselves believers mm -hmm. or adherents who, who interpret those stories fairly literally. And then you have people who write books trying to tear down religions by saying they're not true and trying to make a, a rational, logical argument. Would you say that that's a complete gross misreading of the text, that it's yes. a more metaphorical, poetic, and, and a course of action as opposed to a treatise on fundamental external truths? Yes, I mean, it, it's not about reason. And any kind of myth that ends up in sort of ego uh, is, is, is a bad myth. Uh, the, what the, but a myth makes no sense unless you put it into action. Hmm. Um, it's not enough to tell, and it's not, just as it's not enough to just go to church and sing a few hymns, put something in the collection box, and then go back to ordinary life at Sunday lunch and, uh, and, become, and, and back to the office and back to... Uh, Putting, putting number one first and, and tramping down others. Uh, it's a, a process whereby you leave the self behind. I mean, in science, do you leave the self behind? Well, when confronted with the big truths yes. of the universe, you certainly do feel that your individuality doesn't matter. Yes. If Einstein hadn't discovered general relativity, David Hilbert would have. Mm. And the fundamental truths, the equation, r mu nu minus a half, g mu nu r equals 8 pi g over c to the 4 t mu nu, that would be the same equation regardless of who discovered mm. it. So in that sense, you yes. are leaving the, the self behind. But scientists, like everybody else, get deeply embedded in the work and they identify themselves with the work. Yes. Uh, you know, Ludwig Boltzmann, who committed suicide on his tombstone 
car had carved S equals K log W, his equation for entropy. <laughs> yes. You know, so, so his ego was yes. deeply tied up, yes. you know, with that deep inside yes. of the world. Yes. Uh, but, yes. But and a lot of religion, you see, is, 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 a, is about sort of getting into heaven and getting a good place there. And, uh, and that's all about me. Um, so, again, uh, that, that it, both, in both ways, like... But was there a transition, historical transition, that one can follow, where religion went from a more metaphorical, poetic, interpretive schema to a more literal one? Yes, it happens in Europe in the 16th century. In the universities, uh, people, the students studied Aristotle, before they studied religion. And that means they brought Aristotelian science and logic and put, brought it to bear upon, um, upon reality. So Thomas Aquinas, who lived long before that, uh, says is, is quite clear that God, for example, is everywhere. And wherever God is, God is in there holy. Uh, but by the time uh, they've thought Got, got taken it through Aristotle, God has been uh, confined to a tiny part of the universe. Like heaven? Is like that, heaven yeah, okay. that he has supposedly created. And, uh, the, and now it's up, and, and people are saying, look, looking at the scriptures in a different way. So Roger Bacon in the 16th century says, well now, um, Ad Adam was told by God, take the earth and subdue it. And Adam uh, failed to do this, and that's why he fell from grace. So it's now up to us to take the earth and subdue it, and that's what we've been doing, with the result that we now have a very, very damaged universe, a very, very damaged world. Um, and we're in great peril because of this. Uh, so whereas the other world religions had an entirely different view of God, uh, it's, God wasn't something up there. When the, it's a lovely story that when the Jesuit missionaries in the 17th century uh, went across to China, um, they became part of the Confucian literati. They wore Chinese clothes, they spoke Chinese, and they brought with them the new science that we developed. Uh, that caused great problems, of course, in, in, in Europe, because Galileo and Copernicus, it didn't seem to gel with the theology. Mm. Uh, but uh, the Confucians found that all very interesting. They loved it. But, says one of them, when they start talking about a god confined to a tiny portion of the universe in a heaven, that he, a universe that he supposedly created, Really, they said, this, this, is, this is ridiculous. Um, and what, the, what is interesting is that uh, both China and India, um, thousands of miles apart, developed a far different conce conception of nature uh, with, where, where the sacred is present in a force throughout all things. There's no, uh, there's no single god but there is such sacrality uh, 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 in all things. We, we went on and on confining God in a peculiar way, uh, which, which has made God, for many people, incomprehensible. Has, has your own journey and view of God undergone, I presume, radical change? When you were 17 years old, you entered the convent. Yes. For seven years, yes. I gather, you stayed. If you reflect back on your 17-year-old self's view of God compared to where you are now, what, what is that transformation? Oh, like? entirely different. There's a God up there, a, a, human, a, a, sort of a human being writ large, who is kind of looking at me, and, but unfortunately, and seeing all my faults. And, um, and my job is to get rid of those faults uh, so that I become holy and, and wise, and uh, but uh, but they did that by it was not a very healthy way of doing things. We were continually being told uh, to, uh, to 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 to, to the, how sinful we were, um, and 
we uh, were constantly kissing the ground and uh, sort of pray, trying to pray, and I could not pray. This was a bit of a, as you say, that would, was clearly a rather a drawback for a nun. Um, you, <laughs> uh, because I would, we had to pray in a certain way, making certain meditations. I could not do it. I can concentrate on my studies for hours at a time without you know, lifting my head. But every morning we had to meditate according to St. Ignatius' uh, precepts. He was the founder of the Jesuit order. And I just could not do this. You mean this. Your, your mind would wander? Absolutely, or? it just yeah, went okay. off into a complete tangent. I couldn't control it. I mean, and um, so, and I kept on saying that I, I really can't do this. Oh, no, sister, we all have bad days. Oh. I'd have loved to have had some, some bad days because it would mean some would be good. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that never happened. Um, and eventually I, I left in, and I went right away from religion. I wanted nothing whatever to do with it again. Nothing at all. And what brought you back? Well, it's a strange thing. As I, I kept on trying to get away from religion. Um, and I wanted to be an English literature teacher, and, um, but in a university. Because, and I did a PhD, and um, I failed it. And there was, it was a, quite a scandal at Oxford at that time, because the examiner had said I was a very clever young woman, but in his view, this was not a suitable subject for a PhD in four lines. Uh, and the, he was told that uh, you were supposed to write a, a very detailed... But it was already approved, presumably, your, your topic. Yes, yeah. he didn't mention it. Um, and he was told he would never be invited to examine for Oxford again. Mm. But then what do they do with Miss Armstrong? <laughs> well, they decided, they, they were worried about this for six months, with me in misery, as you can imagine, and decided I couldn't have it, that an injustice was being done, but that if uh, they allowed for re-examination, it would destroy the sanctity of the Oxford Doctorate. So that was the end of my academic career. Huh. Can I give you one small footnote? My doctorate at Oxford was also rejected. Really? It's a different story, but... Uh, really? Yeah, it was corrected ultimately, yes. but just so you know. <laughs> Well, here we are today. Yeah, you exactly. See. <laughs> <laughs> to heck with them. Yeah, right? yeah. absolutely. <laughs> um, but but so you go on this this journey that ultimately brings you back. And I hope this doesn't sound like a facile question. But what does God mean to you now? Certainly not a being uh, in the, the highest heaven. Um, I uh, I just think that the, the sacrality is in all of us. Every single one of us has a sacred core. There's something sacred in all of us. That's, and the, the Buddhists and Indians do, people of India do this, when they hold, the, and, and they bow to one another. Each one of us, just as every single uh, inanimate thing in the planet has some kind of wonder about it. Animals, for example, too. Uh, each animal is, is, is I, I find, quite precious and extraordinary in, in its life. And we, too. Uh, and I think that one tries to uh, can try to cultivate a sense of sacrality in other people, uh, a, a sense of uh, divinity in other people. But one does that by not by doing vast spiritual exercises, but by, I think, by, by treating other people with utter respect. So that each person that you, 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 you encounter is somehow sacred. But that doesn't mean, I don't know, think that that means that we're then going up. I don't believe anymore in a God in the heavens. And I don't believe that when I die, I will go up to join him. Um, Do you have a sense of what will happen when you die? Is no. That, is that it? Or? No, I have no idea. Mm. Do you? I think it's it. Yeah, yeah. I just think my particles will dissolve and rejoin mm. the particles yeah. of the cosmos, and that will be that, and momentarily I was here, and yes. then I'll be gone. But I've been lucky to have this life. Yes, I deeply agree yes. with exactly that statement. Yes. And one of the other connections to this 
perspective, which you, you focus attention on in your latest book, is that it's this reverence for everything that we need to reconnect with in order to survive as a, as a yes. species. And we've, lo we've lost it. Now, in every other uh, religious uh, discipline, in, 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 ev in every other part of the world, in China, in India, uh, they had the, much the same idea of the divine in all things. In all, that it, but that doesn't mean it's God. Just get, there is no God. Gods are part of, they see gods as part of the universe, that they're created by this force. Um, and they're, but they're present in all things, so that he, there's a divinity in all things. So um, that you, and that's, I think, is what we have a sense to cultivate, to look at one another, however unpromising the exterior reality is, <laughs> and see somehow, that, realize that in some sense, there's, there's a sense of, this, of, the, of the sacred in that, but not just in people, but in animals, uh, in, 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 in nature, which is what, what all the world religions had no idea of a god in the heavens, God, what, the, the sacred was everywhere, everywhere. And that one live, one, that w what we had to do was look beneath the unpromising exterior to the sacrality within. And that means treating other people and, and nature with absolute respect, with absolute uh, reverence. And so <coughs> what I've tried to do is sh show in my book show how we can cultivate this because we... we we are in such, uh, uh, we have such awful, we develop such awful habits of just ill-treating nature, and we're still doing it. We keep hearing about how uh, terrible the planet is and what danger we're in. And certainly, I know, in, I, I don't know how it's been here, but in the UK, we, temperatures reach absolutely as, uh, unprecedented heights. Sure. And one of the points you make is that and, and you've made reference to it here as well, that more of the Eastern religions, that, that reverence for nature may have been more present in those perspectives on the world compared to, say, Jewish tradition, Christian yes. tradition. Yes. Uh, monotheism is different from every other world religion uh, because instead of seeing the, the sacred as a force in nature, not a god in the sky, but that, that everything in nature is sacred. Uh, they developed an idea of a god, a single god in the heavens, um, who uh, created everything. But they saw uh, the sacredness not in nature, but in historical events, in the exodus from Egypt, for example, sure. or, or the life of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, though, the Greek Orthodox retained their pagan view of nature and, that, that, and brought it into Christianity because for them, Artemis, the god, goddess of nature, one of the most revered of all the Greek goddesses, they say she was present uh, uh, invisibly in every single plant, every single bird, every single blade of grass. Um, and they, they have retained that. And similarly, interestingly, Islam mm. uh, sees, which sees nature as an absolute miracle that is, uh, that is just as important a revelation as the Quran itself. Now that's extraordinary when you think that this was, hap this was conceived in Saudi Arabia, what is now Saudi Arabia, with this hideous climate, mm. where uh, the, the, the Arabs uh, in the seventh century were all suffering from malnutrition because the the earth, the, 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 the climate could not allow them to buy grow enough food. But they see that, the, and the Quran, you have to understand it. Uh, it. It's no good reading it. And people say, I've read the Quran, it's rubbish and boring. You have to hear it. You have to hear it. Yeah. And it's chanted, it's sung. And uh, that, it, it's, it's like reading the libretto of an opera. Uh, you, you don't get it unless you hear the, hear the chant. And so this, this, uh, 
has encouraged the, a sense of beauty of nature, but instead of focusing, as we, as the Christians and Jews do, on miracles which subvert the natural order, the Quran celebrates the, the uh, just as all the pre-ancient uh, religions did, the, the, the fact that the divine is present in the ordinary nature of things, the fact that the sun rises every day, and that the moon comes up at night, and that, uh, there, that sometimes there is rainfall. Uh, this is celebrated as a wonder, and we don't think of things like that anymore. And, and, and yet, if you look across the world, the problems that we're having today are global, yes, right? So yes. there's, it's, it's not as though these, no. these traditions have somehow kept part of the world pristine. So they, they've, they've lost out to capitalist forces, yes. to, to greed, to, to all the other things that we know have really put us in this place of peril. So does that give you pause no. regarding reconnecting with an approach that <coughs> has kind of failed? I think, yes. I think we've got, to, I, the protests don't do any good, frankly. We, you know, I, I think somehow we've got to re reignite that, that sense. And in parts of the world, when I go to, say, to Pakistan or India, pe ordinary people still have that view of nature. Um, of and does it affect their behavior? I mean, do you, do you, does it go into practice? Yes, it does. But of course, the way that modern societies are now uh, based, and that, that, that rather ignores nature. They've, they've all taken on our Western yeah. habits, and, and that, that, that is still there. But among the ordinary people, um, and when I talk, say, in Pakistan and talk to them about this, they, th their faces beam, and there's a sense of great relief in the room, and certainly in India, that's true. In, but you see, in, in uh, Europe, in, in, especially in the Christian world, we never really had that uh, sense of the sacrality of nature, though Thomas Aquinas, as I say, he did have it, and they, they, but that got lost. And we've now got somehow to, to reignite that. And you actually have made suggestions for, from a practical sense, almost a how-to guide yes. of how one might reconnect I, uh, you know, quiet sitting, contemplating, you know, putting away your phone every so, so but the question I have there is, do you think that would, would, would be enough? We've, no, it's not, but we've got to make a start somewhere uh, because things are grim at the moment. Um, and uh, so we, we, we're comp and now we're not even looking at nature. We prefer to take photographs of it. I mean, how often you've seen, have you seen people in a place of great beauty going, and, and it's the same, I spend a lot of time in the British Museum, I'm involved in that, and it's the same goes on there. Instead of seeing the Rosetta Stone, wow, here it is, they take about 20 photographs of it and m move on to the next uh, installment. So uh, we need to start looking again. And so I, the Chinese, for example, had a practice that they call quiet sitting. And this doesn't mean any huge, great yogic expertise. Just sit. If you start just for 10 minutes a day to start with, sitting, putting away your phones, and just watching nature for a while, looking at the way the birds are, the, the insects, the f trees, the flowers, just for 10 minutes a day, reconnecting with nature that we don't even notice anymore. Then, when you're getting used to that, you could up your uh, up your to 15 minutes, you know, and 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 take it on that way. But uh, there are other ways too, like the word sacrifice, which we we see the word sacrifice meaning killing animals uh, in a in a terrible way in in a pagan. But that that was not the the word sacrifice comes from the Latin sacrum facere to make holy, and uh, that what one it, what was asked to do was to see the, it, the holiness that is in every single thing, in, that every single thing, every bird, every flower, 
has a particular beauty, a sacrality, not like ours. We don't want to sort of uh, impose our humanity on these things. They're quite different. I've got a tree uh, opposite me. Uh, I, in my study, I look up and I see this tree. Uh, I live in the middle of London, so there isn't much nature there. But I watch this tree sometimes, and um, you see uh, the, how it changes over the seasons, so the colours change day by day. Creatures come all, uh, and, and take refuge in it, different kinds of birds, squirrels, etc. There's a whole life going on there. <coughs> but that tree has an integrity and life of its own. And I think we've got to learn to see that the life of things, they have their own integrity, their own life, their own, and, and recognize that as partners of the un, in the universe, uh, not just as uh, objects that we can take a photograph of or cut down or use for our own benefit. Somehow we've got to sort of reignite our sense of reverence and wonder. We're not very good at reverence today. We like being rude to people and um, we, we don't, well, I, I can't say this at the moment, I was, after the Queen shows that, that, you know, the, the, these extraordinary crowds, uh, but we need to show reverence for all people, not just uh, the Queen and not just important people and not just human beings to recognize that there is a different sacrality in everything. And so make a point of, in the day, as you see a tree, making it holy in your mind, seeing that it has a different kind of life, a different kind of preciousness on which we depend. Because uh, the sense of the divine uh, it starts with a sense of tremendous dependence upon the divine uh, of God. And we, now we need to apply that, not necessarily to a God stuck out there in, beyond the universe, but it, the, in every single thing uh, that we see. But I'm wondering if you think, if you look at the urgency mm, of know. the situation that we face right now, I just want to get your, your thought on an alternative but resonant approach to, to what you write about. And frankly, I only became aware, I mean, many people have taken this idea of connecting, you know, the state of the world with our sense of how we connect to it as individuals. But my son, actually, who's sitting right there, I think, with the lights in my eye, you know, in his class, I don't know if you're familiar with this book. Uh, I think the author's name is Roy Scranton. Is that a familiar yeah. name, name to you? I believe the title of the book is Living to Die in the Anthropocene. And it connects to our earlier nice. conversation about death and mortality being a critical part of, of how we find our place in the world because this author is also saying we've got a dire situation mm -hmm. from climate change and the only way that we can deal with it it's not just have ego dissolution at the level no. of the individual, we have to have dissolution at the level of civilization. We have to realize that the way we live has got to change. Yes. And the, the, the reconnecting with reverence that you described would be a vital part, but he's saying we basically have to take a sledgehammer to the way that we've lived and smash it to pieces and start again if we're gonna survive as a species. Do you feel that kind of urgency too? Yes, I, I do feel that kind of urgency, but I'm not sure that slashing down mm. a, a civilization is going to achieve it, because uh, it, it will just create anger, fury, despair, misery, um, and, and, that, and all these negative aspects. Uh, and instead, somehow, I, and we've got to try and cultivate a more positive attitude, and fast. Uh, it, uh, I know it may sound stupid, just start, but starting out for 10 minutes a day reconnecting with nature is at least a start, uh, instead of just taking a photograph of it or ig ignoring it or trashing it. I mean, we, we have still in Britain, still people are still leaving huge chunks of plastic on the beach, which we know and we're told again and again is ruining marine life, but we're still doing it. Um, so, and so somehow we've got to make 
and it's no good just telling people what to do because that, that they get, you know, people get antsy about that. Somehow we've got to change the way we approach nature, and I think we need have to start little by little. It's no good saying, right from this day forward, I'm going to be a, a, a lover of nature. Um, that's not going to happen. Wordsworth um, felt like this, but poet Wordsworth, English author. Um, he, uh, he and his friend Coleridge were very worried about the way uh, Britain uh, was becoming more and more mechanically minded and, and apart from nature. And he, uh, he put himself through some kind of program. And he came, what he came out with, and what he describes in one of his poems, uh, is exactly what the uh, people of India felt when they saw uh, Brahman, when the Chinese saw Chi, uh, th that it, not a god up there, but a sacrality. He says, I have learned to look on nature, not as I did as a, as, a, as a young man when he was just intoxicated by its beauty, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. Now, that's a perfect expression of what Chi, what, how, the, how people saw nature before. He's discovered it uh, within himself. And notice, he uses the word something. He won't call it God, uh, because God has come to mean something quite different for Europeans, some, some being up there in the sky. Yeah. And, uh, it's not, it's, and it is something that you can't name. We use the word something, don't we, so, so loosely, you know, what should we have for supper tonight? Oh, I don't know, eggs or something. Uh, but no, he, say, he uses words something. Um, and if Wordsworth can do that, we can do it. Um, but we've got, we have to, he, he would have put himself, he said he's learned to do it. He'd put himself through some kind of uh, program and simply in the, my book, I've tried to give a, a sense of a start. It, it is only a start, but we have to take baby steps at first um, but, uh, before, so, so that we can begin to sense that something, uh, that sacredness that is infusing nature, and therefore we will treat it in a different way. You made reference before, really, you know, facetiously as a joke to the aliens looking down upon us and perhaps feeling pity that neither of our approaches to the world was <laughs> adequate. Do you, I feel confident that when we make contact with those aliens, they will have some version of the science that we have found. Mm. Some version of classical mechanics, some version of quantum mechanics, you know, some, some version of the scientific ideas that we have developed in trying to understand objective qualities of the world. Do you have confidence that the aliens will have their Wordsworth, their Buddha, their Jesus, their Moses? I mean, will they also have this sacred sense? Will they have developed that too? I would, I would hope so. I would think, yes, I think they might, but they'll be, it'll, it will be expressed in very different ways, probably, from the way we do. Um, and because uh, their worlds will be very different from ours in many ways. Uh, but it, I, I like to think that if there are aliens and, uh, and other beings, uh, that they too have got a sense of reverence for existence, for life. Uh, we know that life is sacred, we know that human life is sacred, but now we've got to sort of spe spe spell that out to 
other, for, other for life forms. And I liked, but it would be sacred in an entirely different way, I would think, uh, from ours, because their brains will be different from ours. They'll see things differently from us. Um, they'll have had different experiences. And um, so I, but still, I would think, in order, it, it, we cannot live outside our environment. That's the thing. So somehow, we have to come to terms with it, not only to come to terms with it, but embrace it and reverence it. And that's what we're not doing anymore. W one final question. You're absolutely right. Obviously, we can't live outside our environment. We can't transcend our environment. But you made reference earlier to the power of mythos and religion mm. to help us reach a transcendent <coughs> state. Would you be willing to share a transcendent moment that you had and, and how you got there? And I know it's beyond articulation, but just to give us a sense of what it was? Uh, for me, I mean, I, as I told you, I had, in the convent I had nothing of that sort and it never, it didn't come through prayer. But for me, it came in a footnote uh, of a, a scholarly book um, that said that uh, the we must we ha that we are looking at we we cannot uh, understand the spiritualities of the past from the vantage point of post enlightenment rationalism, and that which is what we're often trying to do. Instead, we must when we find when a historian of religion, which is what I'm trying to be, find something odd or peculiar in a in a, in a, in a culture. Don't just pass over it and say, well, this is nonsense, of course, or this is just pre-rational pre or stupid. But look at all, everything around uh, that, in that society that was happening at that time, in, intellectually, economically, uh, spiritually, uh, environmentally, and not leave it, he says, until you can imagine yourself in those circumstances feeling the same. In this way, he said, you will uh, begin to make a place for the other in your mind and heart. Now, that's what we've certainly got to do if we want to make uh, a sense with, with other human beings. I mean, we're not very good at that either, are we, at the moment? Uh, we've got somehow to to see that each human being, whatever, wherever he or she may be, has that utter sacrality. Uh, and, and, but we do it by dismantling our own prejudices and entering into the state of another. And I found that that completely changed my view of religion. That was, that was what brought me back to religion. Mm. Uh, when I started studying the religions of the past, instead of saying, well, this is rubbish, obviously, from the point of my viewpoint, entering into that, uh, that, that, that society and not leaving it until I could see in that place I would be the same. And I think we have to do that with nature, too. Uh, and look, uh, learn about nature, um, see uh, the... the this, the essence of even the smallest bird or flower or just begin to see it, it and marvel at it, re realizing that we share the same existence. So for me, it's a, it's a question of dismantling the self a bit, day by day, uh, and entering into other kinds of lives, that other kinds of historical lives and so we can learn a lot from the spiritualities of the past, where people who didn't have our kind of uh, society still had a reverence for nature. Enter into that spirit and realize, too, that each thing has, uh, has a sacrality at its core. Mm. Uh, that however insignificant it may be, it is precious. We need to look at a, a bird or a, 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 mar a, a butterfly or even a wasp and, uh, a, and, and, and reverence it, realize that, that there's something there that we'll never know that is mysterious to us, uh, but precious, just as precious as we are. 
just one final question. Are you fundamentally optimistic about where we are going? I can't say that I am, no. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm, I'm rather a pessimistic person, really. I, I tend to sort of... Uh, be, but we can't allow ourselves just to fall into pessimism somehow uh, or say, well, there's nothing we can do. Because unless we try and do something in however small a way and however insignificant a way, uh, nothing is going to change. And it's not... And our, our, our leaders, our political leaders, even our religious leaders may not be leading us in that way. It's no good relying on them. We, must, we each have a responsibility for the world in which we live, the society in which we live, it, and it's our job somehow to change the way we think and to change the, so that we begin to reverence uh, the smallest thing uh, in the world around us. The vital importance of humility in the face of the great mysteries and knowing yes. that what we know is a small part of the grander whole is absolutely essential. It's so like Einstein who said, who said that, you know, that, 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 the, what, that the absolute wonder of knowing that you are in the presence of something that is unknowable is what he regards as God, as, as, as the essence of life. And we're, 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 we're a bit too omnipotent in our, in our uh, unsure of ourselves and uh, of, our, of our opinions, when we are all in the dark, feeling uh, for what should we be doing now in this, in this uh, and hoping to find some kind of truth in a puzzled world, but uh, we, knowing we'll probably never, never, be, never encapsulate that truth. Yeah, Einstein also said that there are only two things that he could imagine might be infinite, space and human stupidity. <laughs> and he said he wasn't sure about space. <laughs> <But> <laughs> All right, on that, please join me in thanking Karen Armstrong. <laughs>